good morning. <clears throat> Let's try that again. I want a good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Let's don't ever forget that. I want to welcome everybody to the gathering service on this first Advent Sunday. If you're a visitor here, we want to especially thank you for being with us and uh, pray that you will feel at home. As Steve always reminds us, it does not matter what your denominational background is. You may be a church member of the same denomination, but you may be a church member from another. It doesn't matter. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then you are part of this family. We are all together today. If you're searching for a church home, we invite you to consider Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church, a place where Jesus Christ is exalted and a place of trust that will help you and yours grow in faith. Our pastor Steve Fries and his wife Edie are on a vacation trip this week, <coughs> excuse me, visiting with their son in Arizona and enjoying the surroundings of the western part of this great nation of ours. In Pastor Steve's absence, I will be leading today, so please have mercy on me. <laughs> Not only as your worship leader, but uh, behind me, the you know, praise band, I'm going to be part of that, but also as your preacher. Now, I have preached a couple of times before in the past, but I hadn't preached enough to uh, not be nervous at all. So I'm just a little nervous. <laughs> but I hope that God is going to give me the spirit of the words that we need to hear today. In his absence, uh, he wants me to make sure that we have some announcements. And I want to just call your attention to the weekly ringer that comes out. There's quite a bit in here. And I just want to point out a few things. First of all, the Holy Child Christmas Celebration Dinner is Wednesday, December 15th uh, for a charge of $10 per person. It's, uh, there's also an ugly Christmas sweater contest. And uh, this is going to be uh, provided by the Village Strings, the entertainment anyway. I also want to mention about uh, this uh, little item here. Steve has talked with us about the gift commitment cards. So if you're uh, going to give something, this is the time. This will be placed there for everybody, <clears throat> and we'll uh, have it for your disposal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cookie Fellowship, December the 5th. If you're a cookie provider, there's some words in there for you. Warm clothes for the Oakland workers. And it says, in past years, the United Methodist men will be collecting clothing items for the chapel at Oakland to distribute to the workers at the racetrack, especially wanting men's clothing. Uh, and then there's some uh, uh, information here that uh, what they're really looking for, jeans, sweaters, and so on. This is uh, needed by Friday, December the 10th. And I want to give uh, a little bit of attention to a couple of more things. Uh, the annual Christmas Sweetheart Breakfast, Bring Your Spouses, is sponsored by the United Methodist Men, and that's going to be Friday, December the 10th, at 8.30 a.m., so come be a part of that. We're th so thankful to all who have leadership and to give us these special ministries and special events. There's other things in here. I, I really want to uh, encourage you to take a look because a lot is happening at Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church. So I want to talk now uh, and ask you to give us some celebrations, some things that have happened in your past or in your present that you want to share with everybody and that you're proud of. So let's talk about those good things. Yes, ma'am. Our granddaughter Jordan and her husband Ben are going to give us our first great grandchild. All right. Super. First great grandchild in May. All right. Yes, sir. And then I leave tomorrow morning for northern Minnesota to meet our third great grandchild. Oh. <laughs> That's great. Well, Shelly, maybe we need to say in a couple of months, we're going to have our 16th grandchild between us. So I look at my daughter, who's uh, not at the exact age, you know, to be bearing a child, but everything's going well. And I say, you sure you're ready for this? She says, ready or not, here we come. You know. <clears throat> Others, come on. Other good things that you want to share. Yes, ma'am. My baby sister has a birthday Tuesday. All right. 
our percussionist, Sherry, birthday Tuesday. Yeah. I won't, I won't ask you what you're going to do for her because I'll see how y'all relate to one another up here. On this. Okay. <laughs> Others? <laughs> For you who might not have heard that because it's being uh, uh, videoed, they just got back from a trip, a great uh, cruise trip, and uh, they're having to get used to uh, eating just four meals a day, you know. So, and if you've been on a cruise, you know what he's talking about. All right, how about some special concerns that you might have, some prayer concerns? Anyone that you need to be praying for, we need to be joining you in prayer for? Yes, ma'am. Jennifer. Jennifer, okay. And Kathy. Bob. Bob. Justin. Justin. Martha. Bron, yes. One of our faithful members. <clears throat> Others? Brian. Brian. Marilyn? Carol Hecker. Are there others? Okay. I still uh, want us to remember all of those that are shut-ins, and we have quite a bit of people, those who would love to get out but can't for whatever reason. Let's remember them in our prayers. This is the first Sunday in Advent. Maybe you haven't thought about that. We have four Sundays that we celebrate Advent, and this is the celebration of hope. You notice we have the Advent tree here. Uh, we have the four different uh, candles that represent the four Advent Sundays, and in the middle, we have the Christ candle. Today, we're going to light the candle for hope. And I want to turn this over to uh, Terry and Kathy uh, Hendricks that are going to come. And they are going to share some words with us and light this candle. Branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And in this, and this is the name by which it will be called: the Lord is our righteousness. We light this candle to symbolize the hope of Advent. Hope seems to be missing in action lately, doesn't it? We read Jeremiah and we asked, God, when will we truly experience the righteousness and the safety that you have promised? We light this candle and we're reminded that there have always been voices calling out for hope in the midst of injustice, prejudice, and despair. We've just some, sometimes chosen not to listen. Maybe this time we'll be able to listen. Maybe this year we can be part of God's Advent hope. We light this candle not to drown out the darkness, but to illuminate what we have to learn from it. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let us pray. Hope-giving God, help us believe 
that you will truly restore our hope and fulfill your promises of justice and righteousness. Help us live as people of hope in this sometimes hopeless world. Amen. Time now to give our offering to the Lord. Stephen, would you mind uh, grabbing the uh, 
plates and handing them to everybody. We're just going to pass these from the internal to the out to outside there of the group. <clears throat> give generously. Give as the Lord has given to you. Let's offer up our prayer to our Lord. Our Father in heaven, thank you for being among us. Thank you for your Son, his Spirit. And thank you for all the things that you give us. The care, the love, the guidance. And Father, may you bless this offering that we have taken. Use it, Father, for the glory of of our Lord Jesus and also for the furtherance of your kingdom. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand, please, and let's sing together the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> This is the season of Advent when we look forward to celebrating Jesus on Christmas Day. So we're going to begin with a hymn that everyone should know. It's in our old hymnals uh, from way back. It's called Blessed Be the God of Israel. You can be seated if you want, but stand if you want to praise God standing. Ready? One, two, three.
to the Lord. This is the time that we celebrate the advent and the birth of Christ. But remember this about Jesus' birth. Jesus was born to die for us, to go to that cross and praise God for this plan so that we would not have to live eternally without the Lord. Glory to the Lord our God. One, two, three, four, five, six.
I chose a scripture that goes very well as a prelude to my sermon. Today's scripture is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 9a. And I'm reading from the New uh, Revised Version. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Well, then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And the Lord said, Go. Isaiah was very privileged. Heaven was open to him to see and be a part of what was happening. <clears throat> Well, what did he see that was happening? This. Anybody want to volunteer? What did he see? I think y'all are more timid than I am right now. <laughs> okay. There was a lot happening, wasn't there? Praise. The Lord speaking. The seraphs flying around. This particular chapter and the verses 1 through 9 have been covered in both the theology classes and the music and worship classes at the seminary I attended, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. <clears throat> Most theology professors addressing this chapter in Isaiah have interpreted these verses as God's commissioning the prophet Isaiah to go out and be a witness, or some of them said that God is just giving Isaiah a look at the temple. Now I call these noun interpretations. Now stay with me here. A noun is a thing, something, okay? And rightly so. What they said is true. But I think there is a third interpretation of these scriptures that I believe is important, as important as the other two. <clears throat> Maybe more so regarding our understanding of and the application to our relationship with our Lord. Consider looking at these scriptures as a model for Christian worship in light of an active part of speech, the verb. The heavenly host were active in their worship of God. In other words, they were verbing. Now that's my word, okay? They weren't nouning, also my word. My sermon is titled, What is worship. I want us to look and see what it means to applying more verbing to our worship life. Let's look at some general views people have had about the subject and how the Old and New Testaments give information as to how Christians should interpret worship in our church and not just in our church but in our daily lives. Now if one asks the non-believer or the nominal believer, or maybe one whose attendance at church is sparse, you might get these kind of answers about what worship is. Something religious people do on Sundays. Or a funny internal feeling that makes you want to sing. 
or an activity for Christmas, I'm sorry, an activity for Christians of a certain emotional disposition. In other words, we have these high emotions. Or just simply something that leads up to a sermon. Now here's some that I've heard from some church members. Many believe that singing songs is both the beginning and the end of worship, even over the sermon and the prayer. Okay. These are separate items, they say. True worship is praise, I've heard that. Now this is what one starts a gathering with and then transitions into, a, into slower songs of worship. Hmm. Okay. Here's another one. True worship is when the glory is felt in a gathering, when we feel a certain way. That's true worship. I think so far a lot of these have been nounings, you know. True worship only happens when certain songs and certain maybe styles are done. As some styles, some songs are considered more worshipful than others. I used to hear this sometimes. Only the old style gospel songs are worshipful. None of this new stuff is worshipful. <clears throat> Did you ever hear that? <laughs> Excuse me. And here's another one. Don't do any slow songs in the service. Keep everything fast as a build up to my sermon, which is when the true worship begins. Now, most pastors and most people in church haven't said that. But I've been in some revivals, and that's what the revival preacher a lot of times said. Keep it fast. Build them up. Because my sermon's coming, and that's where the true worship begins. I've heard, that. I've heard that before. can't believe it. Before we go much further, let's see what the Old Testament and the New Testament have to reveal regarding worship. As you see, there's a lot of words here that are Hebrew. And I'm going to pronounce them the best way that I can. But look for something that is common to all of these words. Old Testament, okay? Halal, to rave, celebrate, commend. Yada, give thanks, thanksgiving, worship, revere. Jarmar, to play on a musical instrument, to celebrate in song or music. Barak, to kneel, kneel down, salute, bless God, give an act of adoration. Shabbat. To adulate, to adore. Toda, an extension of a hand. Adoration. And here's a nouning, a choir of worshipers. But it has to do with worship. The New Testament. Now, this is the tough one. This is uh, coming out of the Greek. Epaninos. <laughs> I'm not sure, but that's laudation. Laud, singing out. Doxa, glory. Eulogio, to speak well of. Archete, valor, excellence. Now, though the New Testament begins with languages other than the Greek, it is one which is today considered the standard for the New Testament, the Greek version, and is where these words come from. But one word that shows up more than others regarding worship and how to worship is one called Proskuneo, and it's not up here, but proskuneo, P-R-O-S-C-U-N-E-O, is taken from two words. One of them is P-R-O-S, pros, which means to be for, and cuneo, which means kiss or adore. Now, separate, that's what they mean, but when you put them together, there's another meaning, okay, that's similar, and that is that... Uh, one is to prostrate themselves in homage before another in the full sense of worship and not mere reverence or courtesy. In other words, you're not going to go like if I was looking at Jim over here and like something he did, I wouldn't just do that. I'd be down in front of Jim going, praise God for you, you know. Uh, so it's a little bit more. It's giving of ourselves in an homage to our Lord because of who he is, what he's done. And there are 59 uses of this word in the New Testament. 59, more so than the others. And 24 times come from the book of Revelation alone. And there's a lot of worshiping going on there. 
Now, to be completely scriptural, should we re re be required to prostrate ourselves? In other words, get on our hands and knees before God as an act of worship. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> um, this was the standard for the early church, their way of showing respect for Yahweh and his son, the Christ. And certainly God is honored when we do get on our hands and knees in worship. But I think primarily this is a model that was to teach or remind God's people who he is and reverence his son for the sacrifice he gave for them. If you're not on your hands and knees, okay. But when you approach and become in the presence of God, you need to be sure you're honoring him and that you're there recognizing that he is God and we are not. The Old and New Testament terms are often associated with the definition of worship and show us some important and perhaps the most important information <clears throat> regarding approaching our God in worship services and life in general. They all point out in some way that worship of God should be active. Okay, say that word, active. All right, good. They should be active, okay, um, and not passive. Let's contrast passive and active with regard to worship. Now, passive, consider this. Coming into a relationship with God, whether it be a worship service, Bible study, or just at home, without acknowledging who we are entering to, into conversation with who he is. And by conversation, I don't define that as verbally talking. Okay? It could be silent. It could be mentally talking. It could be praying to God or along with someone else anytime prayer is being given to God. It should not be passive, though. Or coming into a worship service and never singing. Okay, I'm a musician now, but listen to this. Just bowing your head when prayer is being said and, you know, listening to the pastor, not acknowledging even to yourself before God what is being said, maybe, and not being careful to stay with the pastor during his sermon. Okay, now, that's two examples, all right? We're going to get into that a little bit more. Active, here's the active, here's the verb, <clears throat> okay? Before you enter into prayer or praise, so on at home, within a small group, etc., begin to prepare your mind and heart. Be positive about who you or your group or your worship service is going to encounter during this time of connection with our Lord. I went to a, as a requirement for one of my worship services, we were told to go to five different denominations and not just the Baptist. I was in Baptist work at that time, but not just Baptist churches and to critique their worship. I went to one service where at the beginning of the service, and I, I loved this, the greeter said, we're so glad you're here. Are you a visitor? Yes, I'm a visitor. Things are going to happen good today. We're going to be in the presence of God. And all of a sudden, things changed. I wasn't just walking through a door. I was walking into what they felt and presenting as the presence of God. They were starting this bond with Jesus at the very beginning. And the whole service was just like that. Everything that was done was active. People were active. Remember, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Isn't that prayer starting off, even Jesus himself using this, that he's setting up the connection? Am I wrong? I mean, he is saying, you're my Father. But when we pray to Jesus, pray to the Lord, pray for the Spirit, we need to set that up. We need to say, I'm here to speak, Lord. You are, you are not me, and I need you. I believe that very strongly. You need to do more than just listen to the sermon. Consider what is being said and put what the pastor is saying against what your own life is all about. If there is something that strikes home, then learn from it. If you disagree with what is being said, feel free to make an appointment with your pastor and discuss it with him or her. But always try to learn something from those leaders who are called and ordained to ministry. That's why they are our leaders. Okay. 
Sing the songs from your heart and let your voice show your singing. Okay. Now, beloved, if you say that I can't sing, that's just an excuse. I'm sorry, it is. You don't have to be like praise band singers. You don't have to be like that singer you know that's so good. Look what the Lord said. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. That's in the Psalms. You know, sing out. God is your audience, not anybody else. Croak on, I always said. You know, <laughs> just go ahead, croak on. Because God is only going to hear sweet sounds when you do that. So, I want us to quickly look at some historical events from both the Old and New Testament sources of Jewish and later Christian worship. This comes from a book that I highly recommend to everyone. Actually, anything that Robert Weber has written has been good. I imagine you know that name, Steve. This one's called Worship Old and New. I'm going to give you some examples here. You remember God bringing the people of Israel out of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea and going on to Mount Sinai? Okay. Well, this is where God entered into a covenant relationship with them. And a striking feature of this covenant is not only the content of the agreement, but the context in which the agreement was made. Most of you know the story, okay? Uh, Moses went ahead, his brother Aaron and others were brought to the mountain, but they could not can continue with Moses, who was granted the right to approach God. Moses built an altar at the foot of the mountain and then set up 12 stones, which were representative of the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? And then uh, there were others that were at, at the bottom of the mountain, uh, willing to, to pray and praise and also to help Aaron and others. Okay, now, when you think about this, God meeting with Moses, understand, first of all, that this meeting was called by God. Now, that's something we ought to think about in our worship. Just as God, it was to him who called the people out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai, just like that, God calls his people everywhere to meet with him. This is not an option, folks. Second, the people are arranged in a structured responsibility. You had Moses at the head, Aaron as an assistant. You might think of a pastor and associate pastor, and then on down. And the last one, of course, is the music minister. But uh, anyway, uh, no, I'm just teasing. But arranged in a certain order of leadership. Third, the meeting between God and Israel was characterized by a proclamation of the word. God spoke to his people and made his will known to them. This shows that worship is not complete without hearing from the Lord. Fourth, in, a, in a, the ascent up the mountain, the people acknowledged their acceptance of the conditions of the covenant, thus signifying a commitment to hear and obey the word. And finally, the meeting was ratified through a sealing of the agreement. You know, in the Old Testament, God required a blood sacrifice. Well, this pointed uh, to what Aaron, what uh, Moses did. There was a blood sacrifice. And that points, of course, to Jesus, who was the ultimate sacrifice by giving his blood for us. <clears throat> you can also look at worship from the tabernacle and temple. I'll give you just two things here. The tabernacle and the temple emphasize the presence of God in the midst of Israel. It was a reminder that the temple represented worship and set the Israelites apart from worship like the pagans. There was a certain way to worship. Both had a symbolic character. It was characterized by a sense of space, rituals, and so on. The synagogue, okay? When the Israelites were dispersed, when the temple was torn down, then small groups began to meet. And what did they have? They had singing, they had prayer, and they had worship. The festivals, I won't go into all those festivals because as Steve knows, there were a lot of them. But there were three main ones, the Passover, Pentecostal, and Tabernacles festivals. I'm going to just talk about the, the Passover. We saw that Jesus' last Passover was with his disciples. And uh, this plays a major role in the early church because Jesus changed this Passover. And he called it communion or the Lord's Supper. And uh, this is something we, once a month, 
observe because it gives life to our service and also tells what Jesus went through as a prelude to being on the cross. There's a lot of other places in the Gospels that Jesus speaks of the way to worship. And I'm not going to go into those. Um, I was hoping maybe that I could preach, you know, even less than what uh, Sheila does, but I think I've surpassed her. So I better, better close this up. But I want you to remember these things about worship. Worship is active. It is not passive. Please sing. Please listen and apply what is being done. The music, the words, the words of the pastor. Remember these points. Whether you are praying, reading God's word, singing praise to God, or otherwise spending private time with our Lord, approach him with an attitude of proskuneo. The attitude. God is mighty, loving, and giving. He is our mighty king who loves and cares for us. But please always remember that worship services were ordained by God. Now, if they're ordained by God, we should hold them in high esteem. They're not ordained by men. We didn't just particularly select that we were going to have church, you know, because it was a nice idea. Been having church a long time in God's house. And to have an intimate relationship between Christ, you know, it was said in the, by God that the bridegroom is Christ and his church is the bride. Well, we know how we ought to be treating each other in a marriage situation. We ought to be doing that in church. Remember, we are connected like a spouse in worship. And it doesn't matter whether you are on a church committee, you work around the church, prepare food for events. If you're not making corporate worship, and you can tell this to everybody, if you're not making a pri it a priority, then there is a real problem. This is what Hebrews 10, 25 says. And I know there are reasons we can't come to church, sickness and so on. But this is what Hebrews says. Let us not give up meeting together. And here's where it stabs the heart as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day, the day of Christ, approaching. And I want us together to say Psalm 100. I believe we have that. Is that right? Okay. Together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Remember that last couple of lines there. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for he's good. He loves us, and his faithfulness is to all generations. Now, this whole passage is active. We need to always approach God for, and thank him for who he is. Amen? Amen. All right. Would you please stand as we sing our final song together? This song just is simple. It's a beautiful song that says, Lord, take my hands, take my life. Here am I. Use me. Teach me.
Lord, make my life useful to Thee. Who am I? Send me, Lord. Here am I. Send me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. So good to have everybody in the Lord's house today. And uh, I just want to say, please make God a priority. Please give God your best. Would you bow, please? Our Lord, we just ask you to be with us as we go out of this place. Help us, Lord, to remember all the things that you have done for us. And while we are not worthy, help us to approach you in the right attitude of worship. And worship is not just a thing, but is something active that we should be doing. And now, congregation, go, enjoy life, praise God, and be safe. Amen.